show has been sponsored by Orchard Hill Assisted Living. The Orchard Hill experience instills a sense of well-being and enhances total wellness in an environment which is warm and relaxed, yet refined. Located along Storied Route 20, about halfway between Worcester and Boston, is the beautiful and historically significant town of Sudbury. Newer homes and businesses mix with some of the oldest buildings we have visited to form this charming town. Our day started with breakfast at the Farmer's Daughter, a farm-to-table restaurant which takes that mission very seriously. Place that we're at. Well, um, we have a lot of history. We opened our doors in 1716 on the wow. Boston Post Road, which was the road from Boston to New York City. And it was built right on that road for, uh, to accommodate travelers. And, uh, you know, we had a house of entertainment and we opened for serving food and for overnight guests as a tavern. That and far back. do you still do that? We do. We still have a very busy restaurant. Um, we do a lot of weddings, a lot of catering. Um, we still have 10 overnight guest rooms, so we accommodate um, guests on a nightly basis. So, and what kind of food do you serve? Um, traditional American fare. Um, you know, um, I would say at dinner time it's kind of traditional steakhouse fare. We have all the steaks covered, all the seafood covered, and uh, you know, um, Lunchtime, we had the Yankee pot roast, chicken pot pie, a little more um, traditional New England style fare. Some of the comfort foods that we serve year round, turkey dinner every day. Oh, um, do you have turkey dinner? We do every have, time? yes, turkey dinner every day. So um, those are the traditional items, but we branch out from there. You know, at lunchtime, you can get a lot of salads, you can get sandwiches, all the above, a burger are you if you want. Thanksgiving? We are. Very busy day. And do families come and rent, rent a room, or do they just rent tables? How do you work that? Uh, so we, we don't open reservations till one month before Thanksgiving Day, and we sell out in about an hour or two. Really? Um, we sell out close to 1,000 reservations in about an hour or two, and then we turn away probably a few thousand people in the month that want to get wow. in, but we can't accommodate them. Wow. If we could probably handle 5,000 people that day, we would be able to uh, book the reservations, reservation. sure. Well, when we drove up, the first thing we saw was a uh, place where you sell plants, a barn over there. Is that part of your domain uh, well, or not? Well, the barn is part of our property. <coughs> Excuse me. We have 110 acres and we have nine historic buildings, and, and I can get into them in a minute, but to answer your question, um, we lease that barn out to someone that has a little flower shop there, kind of like a little outdoor gift shop with, from flowers to, to herbs to um, you know, Christmassy decorations, seasonal decorations. Um, we also have a gift shop indoors that we lease out to a, a local merchant oh, so they, down okay. the street. Yes. Wow. 
So then into more, you know, you have 110 acres, did you say? <laughs> we do. Um, we have a couple attractions on the property, one being the grist mill. Um, Henry Ford was the last private owner of this building and property, and he built a grist mill and a chapel up the street a little ways. The grist mill, we grind our own wheat flour and cornmeal that we use in our bakery. So, so when you sit down in our restaurant and you get the bread basket, not only do we bake that bread ourselves, but we ground the, the really? ingredients for it. So that's one of our claim to fame. So, um, I said the chapel too. He, he built a chapel um, up near there and, and um, he named it after his mother and mother-in-law, Martha Mary Chapel. And that helps us with the wedding business. And you know, a also, lot of people, people get married, get married there. there and yep. then come and have their reception. Sure, oh, kind of one-stop oh. shop. We have a, a Longfellow garden outside that um, people get married in. Um, and again, if you mosey around the property, you'll see all kinds of stuff. We. Uh, we have a trail system and, and you know it loops around everywhere and you can look at some of the artwork in the building and, and see what's what else is on the property and you know we have brochures to hand out for people that are visiting and want to check it out or you can go right on our website and get all the information you want um, if you were planning on visiting here you know you could plan your tour or your visit ahead of time right from the website and see what the attractions are. Everything I've seen here is beautiful. <laughs> I came in, look at the trees out there. They were. What else can you tell me about the inn? Um, well, it's a it's a very busy restaurant. Um, uh, we um, we do quite a bit of weddings, as I said, over a hundred weddings a year. So we we can cater to any size wedding, from ten people to two hundred people. So depending on what size they are, you know, if they want that uh, you know colonial wedding location, this is it. Um, and we get all types of weddings and and all size weddings. You and, ever had uh, them in uh, colonial garb? Um, we have reenactors that are here once a week on the property. We have a local militia group that is um, here once a week and practices once a week. Um, and uh, the Fife and Drum Corps Core that, that is here once a week. Militia isn't there once a month. The, the Fife and Drum is once a week. Every Wednesday night they drill here and, and you know, it's a great spectator um, place to be. Um, on Wednesday nights. We have uh, like a battle reenactment they do in the fall here and everybody's there and a lot of the militia groups from surrounding towns and States. surrounding states come here to be involved with it and of course it's a big uh, fife and drum event. They have a colonial fair the last Saturday in September every year we have a colonial fair here which brings a couple thousand people to the property and it's, it's a big day for us and it's a fun time and it's again a lot of that colonial stuff. stuff. Our second innkeeper, is, he's the most famous of the innkeepers, uh, Ezekiel, and um, he was the colonel of the local militia and um, you know back then um, taverns were you, you know the meeting houses and he could also procure everything that they needed so um, he became the colonel and on April 19th 1775 he was summoned to, to get the Sudbury troops and they marched to Concord and, and they saw battle and they saw casualties. So he, uh, because of that, he's the most famous um, of our innkeepers and I'm number 11 in 300 years. So there's, really? only, there's only been 11. 11? Yes. Wow, in 300 years. So how long <laughs> have you been here? Um, I'm going on my 10th year as innkeeper. I've been here for um, you know over 25, but have I'm going on really? my 10th year as innkeeper. Wow. Sure. Feel free to walk the property. Okay. Not only you two, but anybody that's watching the show, it's, it's fun. We have a lot to offer here. And, uh, you know, I'll certainly be around if you come up with any last minute questions or if you want to give me a phone call to verify anything. Uh, I'm going to let you also talk with Sally. Sally? I, I see her on her way over. And she may, um, she may be able to enlighten you on a lot more things that you want to ask about. And, uh, of course, I hope you enjoy the, uh, the, the menu that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Henry Ford came here with his wife Clara, purchased the property, and really rehabbed what was a very different site in 1923. So next year will be our 100th anniversary of the purchase of the property and the revamping. So we do owe a debt of gratitude to Henry Ford for his vision um, with adding the other buildings that we'll talk about as we go through. Wonderful. So, yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> Um, that was part of Henry Ford's suite as well. Oh, 
Every every room in here has a fireplace, so you're always assured a fireplace view when you eat here. <laughs> this is the old kitchen. This is a favorite room because it still has the old ambiance. Yeah, and, and the oven, you've got the fire. Yes, mechanism there has a series of weights and pulleys. Oh. And that is what would have turned the meat in the fireplace. On our ceiling here, you'll see that there is some charring. Charred. We had yeah. a pretty severe fire here in 1955, which did almost take down the inn. Um, um, there was, it was Christmas Eve, there had been a wedding party, and then it was noticed oh, that an no. ember, a stray ember, um, Boston. And so we have his portrait got there. George there. Um, Good. Today we use it sort of as a loungy room. You know, it's attached to the bar, so the bartender can help people in here, but also into the old bar. Um, and it was originally the family kitchen, so uh, that's what it's okay. originally. This was like. the family kitchen, and that was the inn kitchen. Another old kitchen, yeah. Okay, just <laughs> because checking. the building, you know. It, Typical to New England, the rooms get added on and added on and added on, on with expansions. So, this is the old parlor. So, if you uh -huh. heard of Henry Wensworth Longfellow, uh -huh. <laughs> this is the room where his friends would have sat and talked and discussed the events of the day, poetry. Um, and they were coming here toward the end of the 19th century and they invited. Henry Wazer Longfellow to come from Cambridge because he was at that point um, recovering from wounds and also the loss of his wife Fanny, who had died in a very tragic fire. Um, and so he was not really writing. So I think his friends were, you know, trying to get him out and about and get inspired. And so after his visit, he wrote Tales of the Wayside Inn. And that is a a modern portrait of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow as he would have looked toward the end of his life. The clock um, did survive the fire. And, and you feel really like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna be in for a cozy adventure when you're, <laughs> oh, wow. when wow. you can smell history, there's nothing yeah. like it. So we offer really something for all the senses here. Yes, and the, you do. The tankers belong to colonels from the Sudbury Companies of Militia and Minute, which is a, another nonprofit group who use our site periodically. They're a reenactment group. And so they're always, you know, here to do ceremonial things such as, you know, if a bride would like to have a musket fire or um, they change the flag over our front door three times annually and there's pomp and circumstance along with the um, the Sudbury um, Ancient and Honorable um, Society, which um, does the music to go with it. So the Fife and Drum Company. So the Howe family, yeah. So they originated in Marlborough? Yes. And they came here? And they had a tavern. Whereabouts, we're still trying to find out. Um, but they did have a tavern so that when they came to Sudbury and land was given, um, David Howe was able to know what he was doing. The room that you're standing in is called the Hobgoblin Room. There was allegedly a story of one of the Howe um, relatives did see something in the corner, and so it always has carried that name. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But again, you can see some of the charring they left behind so to teach about it. Too? And, and you can, see, yeah, it covered the whole the whole wow. place, and so you can see where they, you know, had, had to do it, some yeah. patching. Um, but this is, you know, this room goes in concert with our ballroom, which you can head to. So Adam Howe would have put the, the main ballroom that no longer exists because of the fire. Um, you know, he was the one to really, he was the middle generation and he was a great businessman. And so he really capitalized upon the stagecoach and what, coming and through. And what year was that that he? It would have been later 1700s into the, the, the early the, 19th century when travel by stagecoach was happening here along the Boston Post Road. Um, and so he would have dinners and balls and all of that. This would that. have been the headline of the day, Wayside Inn Ravaged. There it was. So this is the section that had the dining rooms. Uh -huh. You know, and it talks about the antiques and things, and then you can see just how wild it was. And we had to call in many towns for assistance. 
um, because we didn't have adequate fire trucks in Sudbury yeah. either. So um, that so it was, was more of a country town at that time. Somebody yeah, said yeah, until the seventies. Yeah. yeah, and then the big the big development boom happened at that point. So and this cost five cents. I see this paper. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can see that is the bar that we were standing wow, in and this is the doorway to the bar and that is oh, the, the settle where and this was December 22nd 1955 at 2 a.m. Oh. Mm -hmm. and I assume there were a lot of people nobody got hurt right? well at that point I don't know if there were overnight guests but there was a night watchman look at this story of Jerusha Howe. You know, we have a lot of people that come to talk about Jerusha the ghost um, because they say that Jerusha, she was only 44 when she died. She died of a broken heart because her love went back to England and never returned and they never heard from him again. Um, but in reality, there was a lot more to her. She was born at the turn of the 19th century and then she was in this family business. She had to help her two brothers run the place after her father had passed away. Um, and then her mother died just a few months after she did. So there was a bit of a burden to running the inn. Um, we do not exactly know what school she went to, but she was sent to a finishing school and where she would have learned um, music and art like needlepoint and we think we found in our collection oh my goodness um a textbook that was created for the school that we suspect she might have Look at you know, studied at so it's a hand written textbook all with math and figures and facts created by the teacher and it was just down in our collection. So as we started wow. poking around during the pandemic, there you go. Oh the God. other thing that is a favorite piece of mine is this other piece of paper on the top shelf. I had a friend who was helping a woman go through her home. The woman had passed away. And my friend was in charge of you know, sorting through all of the contents. She put her hand into a box, and the box was full of all sorts of things and animal droppings and everything. She reached in and pulled out this crumpled piece of paper and then she opened it up and lo and behold, it has Jerusha's how hand, Jerusha Howe's handwriting, Jerusha at age 12 and it's a draft of a sampler. So did she do it when she was at school? How, how did this woman who was somehow related by twists and turns to the Howe family, how did she end up with it? Why is it in this box? kind of randomly, but it's one of our most important collections items at this point. So, so. people uh, feel that, I'm reading stories yeah. and some about objects moving from unlocated. So <laughs> have you experienced that? I have not stayed over yet, but I intend <laughs> to. We thought it would be fun while we were creating the exhibit to have our staff like stay overnight. We never got to because we were always too busy. But um, people do talk about it. So as if you're about to walk out. <laughs> Where this is what the parlor used to look like, kind of full of furnishings. So the drivers and drovers room is to the left. That is where the men who uh -huh. were driving the teams with the stagecoach would stay over. Oh. And uh, I don't know why that sign is in there, but anyway. Um, so you can get a sense of some of the antiques and some of them we just acquired. Some of them were left here by Ford but there are more colonial than you would see in other parts of the building. But the piano in the corner is a piano forte that, that belonged to Jerusha Howe. And it wow. is our most prized collection piece, wow. I would say. It did, it did sustain damage during the fire, but again, because the ice from the fire hoses and the winter night froze around it, it sort of was encased in this ice and that Saved it. it was stuck to the floor. Can, One can of the. I'm not asking, but do, can you still play it? 
Um, I have touched it to test it out. Okay. <laughs> I will admit. Um, but, you know, it needs a lot of work. So I don't know. I don't want to know how they got it up the stairs, but they I did. I just gave one of those away. Oh, you know, my just goodness. Just recently. It's just hard to part with those. Now, okay. You're taking a delicate bite? I am taking a delicate bite of lobster. Mm. It's that good. I'm a lobster lover and it is good. Not too much mayonnaise at all. It tastes delicious. Yum. Yummy yum. Henry Ford wanted to build a quintessential New England village here at Wayside Property. The inn was there. He put this here, he had it carted over, reassembled, and it was actually used as a school until the 50s by the town of Sudbury. Mary had a little lamb. Yes, so that allegedly there was a Mary Sawyer in Sterling, and she did inspire the poem. That you know, is beautiful. The door looks open to me. Do you want to see if we have to get into the back? But do you want to walk over there, Dave? Foraging walk a couple of months ago and learned that this place is covered with edible plants and weeds that <laughs> who knew? <laughs> but a neighbor did that for us, so. This is beautiful. That was local. Wow. Carted in by oxen. To go up? Sure. I'm fine. <laughs> Hi, how are you? T shirts that say two grannies. Yes, they're visiting every oh, town. That's oh, what I said oh, when I oh, saw oh, them. Oh, <laughs> oh, nice. So it gets ground, then we pour seeds in here, drops in a hair. Um, this moves, there's one under and that's fixed. Centrifugal force will push the seeds out where they can start the grinding process. That's not a wheel outside, we talked about that. Right. It yeah. rotates. It'll turn the grindstones, it's a 1 to 25 ratio, so every time that large paddle wheel turns, the grindstones turn 25 times. Wow. That's how it's wow. uh, Ford's engineering, of course. Um, so against the wall, we'll see a giant here, which you could probably maybe see from... Yeah, that's the matter. You can kind of look through, as a few cobwebs there, we oh, yeah, that effect. Um, so against the wall is the bull wheel that will turn this foreground gear, right here. Sure. Which will then turn gears that you can't really see because they're divided by these concrete blocks. Uh, there's a gear in there that turns this horizontal shaft right here, um, which then turn the vertical shafts, which are directly below those grindstones. Uh -huh. Heavily supported, there's four tons of stone being supported by wow. this. Um, so it's a, just a series of gears that have been doing it to it since 1929, That's which is pretty remarkable. It um, is. We did have a piece we replaced on this. Right here we were down to one setup and we got that replaced and it's one of those support arms. The actual arm is upstairs under the posters and we can't just toss it out because Henry Ford put it in. I was thinking dramatically displaying it under glass on a table. Mm. Just as a joke, like no description of what it is. People like, why is this? And that's right. Let They'd me, be asking. Let, that. Let, let, let me tell you. Yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so that's kind of cool. Um, but this is what I really wanted to show you down here as well. So this is Thomas Edison was was Henry Ford's employer at Detroit Illumination, um, and they became lifelong friends after uh, Henry Ford like uh, invented the automobile. <laughs> he just you know, motorizing a horse and buggy. Uh, so Fort, uh, Edison was constantly on this property. That's his generator. Wow. That he, you know, okay, so this, contrary to the narrative of this, that generator was used, and he put this in over here. Here's the mill generator with phase AC and DC, which is no longer in use, but it's a historical artifact in a sense, because we have modern power. Um, but that generator would have been hooked up to this as one big wheel of the belts, catching the grooves on the generator, making power. It's the same thing as Hydro Quebec. Wow. Or Niagara Falls harnessing. It's the, the same, same thing. And, and Ford was obsessed with hydropower, as was Edison. So they were like the perfect uh, team, team to, to mess with this. Um, also part of their like sort of uh, man cave, in a sense, was um, uh, Harvey Firestone, who was uh, a colleague of Henry Ford. He had, well, there was a rubber plant in, in, uh, in Hudson. There's parts of it still there, Fall River. And of course, who do you think he sold his tires to? 
What, four? And then, of course, Edison invents the car battery. Uh, so he's got a captive audience for, let's see, uh, cars, uh, Henry Ford. So it's just a symbiotic. <laughs> wow. And just to think that even Babe Ruth was part of the narrative, who lived at 558 Dutton Road. Yeah. Was Which around in by. these times. Yeah. He would sit at the table in the tavern, the big square table, which has a hidden chest in it. Um, there's pictures of him in his work clothes because he would farm, home run farm was the name of his farm. And uh, I just love the thoughts of all these things going on at one time. Must have been an exciting time to be uh, in Sudbury, uh, you know, running across yeah. these characters. And the women were recording it. <laughs> What's that? The women were recording it in our hostess diaries. <laughs> oh, okay. Toward the end of a very busy day, the Orchard Hill Assisted Living Facility invited us to speak to the residents about our adventures. We just had to end our day at the New City Micro Creamery to test the quality of their <laughs> ice cream. Wow. That was salted caramel Oreo ice cream with brownie crumbs on top. Sorry about the late picture. <laughs> How is it? Ah, uh, it's great. And don't forget to put the peanut sauce on top too. Oh yeah, peanut butter sauce. Really delicious, delicious. Ooh, mm. jealous. Yeah. <laughs> it could be trouble. It looks like trouble. Oh yeah, we're trouble. We're big time trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so this handle over here used to pump the bellows. Before the building was electrified, someone had to pump the bellows if you were going to hear the organ. So a boy would typically be paid 17 cents per service, and services lasted three to five hours and he would pump the bellows. He was called the bow boy.